Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar tonight on all about unschooling in Alberta. And tonight we have a, a panel of four lovely, lovely unschooling parents who have tons of experience and lots to share with you. So we, we in the spirit of, um, of directed learning, self-directed learning, we want to answer the questions you have. So I think we'll start off. We're we're aiming to go to about uh eight thirty. My clock's still not changed. <laughs> eight thirty, and uh, we want to get all your questions answered. So we're gonna try and keep things to a minimum. And yeah, away we go. So Golda, do you want to start? Um, maybe introduce yourself and see. And maybe give us your idea. How did you get into unschooling? And what is your definition of unschooling? Yeah, I so I'm Golda. I'm a, a member, a board member of the Alberta Homeschool Association. I represent Northern Alberta right now. Um, and I started unschooling my son around grade four because I took him out in the middle of grade three. I had been the principal of the school that he was in so I was a long-term teacher and I had been a principal uh, and and I started to recognize early on I think in grade three when I took him out that he wasn't he might be compliant he might do the worksheets and all the things I was asking him to do but I didn't actually think that he was learning anything and then I met Judy and I had read I had read a few books about homeschooling I was very interested in in the, like the the whole thing in Alberta, uh, what what was going on in Alberta? I was actually tasked with research with a public school division to find out what what homeschooling was all about in Alberta, and I kept running into, uh, I kept running into people who were unschooling, including Judy, and then I met Robin Robertson, who has a podcast, Honey, I'm Homeschooling the Kids, and her her podcast was all about unschooling at the time, and so I got really interested in. And what is this all about? And so I, I was doing research and I noticed at the same time that my son was being, who is now 15, but at the time was nine, uh, what, you know, he wasn't retaining any of the information that he was learning that I was, you know, he was compliant, he would do it, but he wasn't, it didn't seem like there was any retention. And I started to wonder if these unschooling uh, experts were right that maybe you had to be engaged in your learning because you were interested and you chose it and you wanted to you 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 wanted to do it and so when he was interested when he did pick something he would remember it later so I I started to think that that might be more valuable than just mere compliance with a, a system or with uh, something that someone else picked for you and I, like everybody else who unschools, was very nervous that he wouldn't learn the right things at the right time and maybe would get behind. I've since let go of a lot of those fears because I, I, I see him really learning deeply when he's interested in something. So I guess that's my definition of unschooling, allowing a, a, a human being to choose what they learn when they want to learn it and and with some guidance because I'm still a mom <laughs> uh, but but still just you know we have discussions more I hope that he comes to a conclusion that I want him to come to but he doesn't always um, say for example I get nervous every once in a while about math or something like that or reading levels or whatever but in general I, I feel like him being child directed him being self-directed learner has been more valuable than what I was doing before. So that's right. that, that's kind of my story. Thank you, Golda. Um, Cynthia, you want to go next? Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, too. It's, it's so cool to see a massive group because I think when the rest of us started, we were just we. <laughs> so that was it. And it was scary to be by yourself. So um, I'm thrilled that that we are surrounded and that you are surrounded. Um, but yes, my name is Cynthia Fair. I am also a member on the Alberta Homeschool Association board, and I represent the Medicine Hat area. And we sort of fell into unschooling by accident. My oldest son decided that he was not going to attend school in his grade seven year. 
after Christmas. And we were very fortunate to have the principal at the time actually sit us down and have a coffee. And she's like, I will fight for you, whatever you need. I will support you. I believe in what you're doing. I believe this is the best for your son. And, and then my second son, who was in grade four at the time, said the same thing. I'm not going back if he's not going back. <laughs> I'm like, oh, great. Here we go. We have no idea what we're doing. My family was was very nervous. They were not that they weren't supportive of us as, as a family, just not really keen on what our choice to be at home. And I was the mom who was like, you're going to do the work and we're going to have school at home. And eventually we collapsed in a heap and a lot of tears and a lot of fighting. And I said, that's it. We're done. <laughs> so we, we kind of said, forget it to the workbooks. And I let them leave, which was probably the most scariest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Cause I was like, what is going to happen? And now I'm not scared anymore. My oldest is 19 going on 20 and he takes chemistry books and calculus books and notepads and and world war whatever books all along just to travel in a vehicle um he's always got his nose into something and and he has found what he wants to learn like what golda talked about they they gravitate towards what they're learning because they're actually interested in learning it I mean, I don't remember ever taking a World War II book along anywhere because somebody told me I had to read it. I took what I wanted to to learn. And and now the second son is uh, going on 17, no longer grade four. I mean, they do grow up and, and your fears sort of wane and there's things that you're still nervous about, but you look at what they can do and they do it. I... I don't know. It just, it's mesmerizing watching them build computers from scratch in an hour and a half because they want to, not because somebody told them they had to. And, you know, another child will do something completely different. Both my boys are very, very different in their learning styles. The oldest one, like I said, he, he grabs for the textbooks and the youngest one does not. He loves hands-on. He loves computer. He loves uh, to play a video game that has a storyline to it so that he can read and act along the way and be part of the characters. Whereas my other son would pr prefer to have his nose in the book and and imagine his way that way. So for us, unschooling is hands-on, hands-off. We we learn on the go. It's sort of an all-year round. We It doesn't really look like we take the summer off because our summer looks the same as the rest of the year. So that that has been our journey and yeah i hope that encourages you krista <laughs> hi everybody i'm also on the alberta homeschooling association board i'm in calgary i have two kids they're in i guess grade four and grade six i tend to forget because like when they're not in school you don't have to think what grade they're in um and with unschooling you're not buying all the curriculum um I did start out buying curriculum and thinking I needed to do that with my kids. And like Cynthia said, it, it ended really terribly in tears and sadness and it was not good. And I met a group of friends out in where we used to live in Toronto and they were all unschoolers and they had much older kids. And it really helped me to see that, oh, this is possible. And their kids are, they're okay. They're actually really good kids. And, uh, so we sort of started to lean slowly and slowly into that. And now that's really what we do. Um, it's been pretty amazing to watch my kids um, growing and, and learning. And um, I guess the latest thing they've done, my, my oldest, she's been taking a, a STEM class and they had them building airplanes out of like styrofoam. And I bought a big piece of styrofoam from the dollar store like foam board I guess and she just like she, I, I had some instructions for her from the teacher about the airplane they were supposed to make but she's like mom I just did it by myself and she made up her own plane and it works and it flies and she was feeling pretty proud of herself so it's kind of neat to watch and see their confidence grow and bloom awesome thank you Krista I'm still trying to get my camera working. <laughs> um, 
camera working in your other profile? Yes, I got my phone going and now I'm trying to get rid of my... Uh... I can, I'll, I'll pin you with the other profile. Okay, thanks. So I'm Judy. <clears throat> I um, started off with my two kids in school, grade one and two, and um, they absolutely didn't like it at all. Um, one was smart, super smart, and was bored, and one had a learning disability and couldn't read when he was in grade three. So I pulled them out to homeschool, and like a lot of homeschoolers, you know, you 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 take the only model you know, which is a school model, bring it home, and find out it doesn't work. <laughs> so you're in tears, kids are in tears, work's not getting done, and you think, oh, maybe I should put them back into school and, you know, be their friend again. <laughs> so um, I wasn't going to, but... Um, but we just slid into unschooling them. We got less and less schoolwork done and more and more fun projects. And we did that for the next 10, 15 years. So um, I have four sons and one daughter. And all of them didn't do a formal math class till about grade eight. And then they skipped grade nine. And then they did grade 10, 11, 12 in various ways, either through online programs or when COVID hit, self-taught. <laughs> they just taught themselves through the textbook and, and we hired um, we hired uh, tutors. And um, yeah, so they did up to grade 12 and then three of them did Math 31 Calculus through various ways too. So four of my kids went into STEM programs and I'm not going to tell you what, because they're all in professional programs where you could hunt them down probably. <laughs> but it was very interesting to see um, how they learned and how they absorbed things of interest to them. And it was really nice to see that I wasn't fighting them anymore. That was probably the best. So my definition of unschooling is empowering kids to learn whatever they want, when they want how they want, if they want. So if they don't want to learn it, it's being okay and saying, wow, let it go, whatever. You don't have to learn this right now. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So that's our definition. And tonight we're going to really, really focus on um, unschooling in Alberta, right? So um, maybe maybe we want to start with just addressing or emphasizing that you can unschool your children on both supervised home ed programs and unsupervised home ed programs with just the government. Okay. You can get funding or you choose not to go the homeschool board route and, um, and have the two teacher visits a year and do a written home education plan. So, yeah. Um, did I forget anything panel? Any, anything people should know? <laughs> no, that's a, a really a, a important question that you already answered. Cause that's a question we see on the Facebook groups a lot is, can, you know, I'll, I'll go the unfunded route because I want to unschool and that's not, that's not necessary. You can still get funding for all the projects and field trips that you have done throughout the year even if you're unschooling, even if your child directed education. And there are plenty of facilitators out there that support that. Yes, that's interesting. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, would anybody have any questions at this point that you want to just unmute and ask? Maybe keep it quick if it's more a general question, if it's more a personal question, and let's try and make it general so everybody can benefit probably from the answer. So, um, I think we could talk to maybe while we're waiting for questions about how how it works, like how we, you know, the registration route, if you're gonna go funded with the school board, how that works, would anyone like to? Would anyone else like to start? Because <laughs> I can talk about it forever. <laughs> Too, I don't take up all the time. <laughs> For me, 
what I did was I, when, when I got to Alberta and wanted to start unschooling my kids here, I was a little bit scared because I was like, can I do this with having to come up with the plan and, and, and everything. And, and it was kind of overwhelming to find a facilitator, but I, I fortunately thought to do a search and found the Alberta homeschooling group. And, and there was a whole bunch of different um, school boards and whatnot listed on there. So I kind of went through those and Judy also had a sheet on there with like, um, which school boards are are religious and which ones are non-religious and which ones will are are more supportive of unschooling and which ones um so so that that was really helpful to find that um and so then I went through and I filled out there's a, a form you fill out to I, I, maybe someone could drop the form into the chat so that if anybody needs it if they're starting um homeschooling but you fill out a form and it gets sent um if, if you're going with a school board and um, it's, I think, was it $901 this year that we got per kid? Um, and it's just like, you get funds back for things that you've put in your education plan and your facilitator should be helping you to make that education plan. And a, a education plan, I was really nervous about it right away, but it's like a living document. If you've got a good facilitator, they're gonna make it a living document that, that can change week by week as you go through school because one week your kid might be really interested in learning all about all the different type of dogs and the next week they might be more into horses or whatever and that is totally okay does that cover it <laughs> yeah i think that's perfect okay. okay we have some questions thank you krista that's a really good good and thank you golda for posting those lists um yeah. krista or some krista says I hear and read all the success stories of unschooling. What do we do or how will we know if it's not working? Okay, anybody want to take a stab at that one? I think I think I so I can answer that because my son struggled and I don't mean struggled academically. He did that too. He recently was diagnosed with ADHD actually. But um he struggled because he had an electronics addiction. And I think when we're parents, we know when something's wrong, just like we know when something's wrong in other areas of life, you know when something's wrong. It's not that fear feeling, like you're failing and you're not good, you're not doing well, because we all feel that. It doesn't matter what we do. Um, we all have those moments when we feel that fear feeling. But when something's really wrong, when you're really not, it's really not going well that's you you know like you you'll know because it'll feel bad and you'll feel you'll you'll you, you'll see a an issue it'll make you feel something I think that's my answer is that you'll know because my son like I mean it looked like he was just a gamer right but I knew something was wrong and so he has he has a an addiction actually addiction to the dopamine that he's experiencing from gaming so we've had to uh, have some parameters and I guess that's what you work through when you find an issue with your child in any area not just schooling not just education anybody else want to answer that in their own way because I and that's just my opinion I <laughs> I guess I could jump in a little bit and say that like for me um I guess like I can look back at at things my child was doing a year ago because of the learning plans actually that I do. And it's like, oh, we've actually come really far. I, I, I was forgetting that her reading was like this or that she really despised writing, but now she'll write a sentence and there's no tears. Um, so that's actually helped me with sort of realizing that, okay, this is, we, we are making progress and you can see the progress through, through those reports um, that you make. So that yeah. like, yes, if you weren't making any progress, you wouldn't see that happening. Hey, I just want to add, um, no, I don't want to add anything. <laughs> Cynthia, did you want to add anything? <laughs> no, I just I agree on both on both sides. You you just you just know as a mom as a family and 
Um, I mean, our son, one of them just, he loved, loved, loved to read. And then all of a sudden he just sort of faded off of reading. It just wasn't his thing. And in that way, it's, it's even like it, it, it may look as though something is like off or wrong too, but we were just like, you know what? Maybe he's just setting it down for a while. And sure enough, I mean, it took him a few years, but he has picked up books again. He asked books for Christmas and now he's reading a new series. And so sometimes it's just the, it's just watching them navigate it and not comparing to what anybody else is doing. It's, it's like Krista said, you compare to your child's chart, not you know, Dave or, you know, Lance down the street, you compare as to what has been going on in their history, not even to another sibling, not to you in your home, your, your schooling journey either. Because I I often think about that. It's like, oh, I wasn't like that when I was that age, or this is how I learned. And it's like, not even it's it is so, so very specific to them. Excellent. And I, I would just add to that, you know, when you see those nuggets of learning, because in unschooling, we don't have a lot of output. We don't force our kids to do exams or to write essays. And in school, assessment is the other half of teaching, I'm learning, <laughs> where um, assessment, you have to have output from kids to assess and um, to let teachers know how they're doing so they can communicate that back to the parents. But you're a parent. You see, you know where your kids are at in certain things because you observe them all the time. You do not have to do assessment tools to find out where where their strengths are, where their needs improvements are. So we just take that whole school piece out of there. And, um, but, and, but you definitely focus on the successes. Take pictures. Um, if they want to tell you about a concept they just learned about, record it. You know, you'll love looking at it later and you will love sharing it with your facilitator too. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question is, um, is there anything specific we should need to encourage them to learn? And my short answer to that question is teach them how to find out. So um, I think the best thing I did was got my kids on the internet really early and they could learn what they needed to learn without me around pretty well. <laughs> and we're we're kind of one of those unlimited families. We didn't have um, net nannies. We didn't have limits. We just, um, when the kids ran into things that they wanted to question, they would come to us and we'd explain it and all was good. So teaching them how to learn, learn to learn. So that's my answer. Anyone else want to add to that one? I would see a library card. Like if your kids got a library card and you bring them to the library, that's just been like so good for us. Like I would not be able to afford the amount of resources on the $901 that the government gives us without my library card because my kids, like we get free printing from the library for the month, um, like up to $5 or something per card. And you just, my kids read so many books that that $900 would be gone in like two months. <laughs> Hey, Cynthia or Golda, anything you want to add? Nope. Okay. Um, next question. Ashley says, I would love to learn more about unschooling through high school. Um, I, I could just answer this really, really quickly is in Alberta, you have two choices through high school. Well, you don't, your kids do. <laughs> they can either go the diploma route or the no diploma route. And I'm just, yeah. I'm just going to oh. reiterate oh. here that. Um, I, was, I get you. Oh, can we mute there? In no, none of the major universities across Canada require a diploma. Um, what they require is probably anywhere from three to about six high school, grade 12 course marks. So if your child wants to go on to post-secondary, it's probably better to wait. Um, you know, wait till they get to about grade nine, grade 10, and then have a chat with them about, well, what's your goal? Where Where's your direction? 
see where their interests lie, and then work backwards. So look at the post-secondary schools, look at what courses they need. Oh, well, look, you need Math 31 and you need English 30. Well, how are you willing to go for credits in those courses? Is that something you want to do? And um, how do you want to do it? Do you want to learn it through online? Do you want to go to an upgrading school? Do you want to self-teach and just write the exam? There's many, many ways to do high school because high school isn't grade by grade. It's course by course, right? So um, a lot of unschoolers can just bypass the entire system, go right into grade 12 at age 19, take the course, and they are, they are very motivated at that age, and then um, get their credits and marks and go on to post-secondary. So that's one way. There's many, many ways. Um, anybody else want to add anything about unschooling through high school? Oh, I just want to add to when you do high school courses through home education, um, you, you can very much make it your own child's course. Um, none of my boys liked Shakespeare, hated it. So we just simply decided we're not doing Shakespeare for our course mark. <laughs> yes, they're going to have to do something for the diploma exam, but that's, that's all they wanted to do. And that was okay. You can really, really modify um, while still meeting the course outcomes, um, depending on your board, of course. <laughs> okay, anybody else want to add anything about high school? I think too, a lot of, I don't know, if they, I had to leave because uh, I was getting a phone call I couldn't miss, but um, I was, I, I think too, a lot of people are interested, a lot of kids are interested in trades and in, for trades, you only need five courses. You need math 10-3 uh, and 20-3, science 10 and English 10 and 20 and 20 dash two, which is the lower level English. And then you can uh, become an apprentice and then you can get into trade school. And most of the trade schools that I've seen so far have uh, accepted that as uh, the minimum requirements in Alberta, depending on the program, because some are more competitive than others, but um, that's usually adequate to get into an apprenticeship for a trade in Alberta. So that's something that's that I'm that's looking at too, because that's what my son is kind of geared towards is the trades. Yeah, that's such a good point, Golda. And and to tag Judy in that also is, yeah, working backwards. Because when we went to the college to meet uh, with one of the, the entry officers or clerks or whatever to to help us decide okay what do we what does my son need to need to have before he is going to apply <laughs> he opened up the book that shows you actually what you need and what you don't need and and it was very interesting um his wording and so he just he said after the age of of 20 like when they become a mature student it changes dramatically. A lot of times in colleges, they'll they'll accept a high school diploma for those first two years. But once that child becomes a mature student, they need some course marks, really. Um, there's, I think he said in government and in healthcare, oftentimes they require a diploma. But there's many, many, many other uh, trainings and courses and things that you do not need a high school diploma in order to to get in so it's it's great to look at that because he said there's no point for any student to slog through a whole bunch of things that they do not need and sometimes high schools or you know other parents that you talk to this is where the comparison thing is don't ask other parents go go straight to the root because they don't they don't really know how the system works and he just told us he's like Mom, he said, this is all a game. You just need to know how to play it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, he just said that. Those weren't my words. Those were his words. <laughs> so it is. It's really, really good if they have any idea of what they, you know, are interested in to so start there and then work on that stuff. I mean, no learning is a waste. You will take it with you wherever you go. And and when you do that, you talk to those people. Sometimes you find out about other things like micro-credentialing where they can take you know, small little courses that um, are very, very minimal cost between the ages of 16 and, and 19. Uh, my son was able to participate in a skid steer course 
and he got his uh, first aid and CPR and he got um, his forklift. He can take crawl space and fall protection. All of those courses together, if you were to pay full price, are like $1,200 in Alberta. And he paid an entry fee of $100. When he completes everything, he gets his $100 back. So it's all free. And they offer that every now and again in different communities. So so there's just, those things look really, really good on a resume. And my son was like, I don't know if I'll ever use it, but it's kind of fun just to take it, just to see what's, you know, what's going on. So that adds course credits also, like high school credits. He's He gets that. Um, send to him and and it's all recorded there so anyway extra thoughts there but some things to consider thank you and Golda your your son's approaching high school anything you want to add to that on how to unschool through high school yeah I guess unschooling is child directed so if he wants to finish high school it's just giving giving him what his choices are like finding out what it is myself and then telling him what all of his choices are so he can decide what he wants to do. Right now he's leaning towards the trades, but I, I also know how to to get um like to get the other things later if he wants to. So and Judy's book is excellent for unschooling to university if anyone is looking for a written form <laughs> format. We should probably answer some of these 101 questions, though, because I know a lot of people don't know what the process is. They're switching provinces. They don't know what, you know, what, how to even start homeschooling at all in Alberta, I'm, unless we want to continue with the high school. If anyone else has anything to add, sorry, I just, I see a lot of questions about, like, what's a facilitator? How do you do it? Step by step. I think we should and you know what, we're, we're going to do sometime in April, we're going to do a high school one. Um, yeah. So be sure to sign up for that because I am, I am the queen of unschooling high school. So I would be very happy to just talk you through how, how to do it all. Cause it's very good. Okay. So, and it's, and, and there's one up on the website already, right? Oh yeah, there is. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely going an unschooling slant. So it's the, the easiest way to get those high school credits for getting on to where they want to go. Right. And my, my, one of my kids became an engineer and he didn't even graduate before he went to engineering university. So he was in year two when he got his diploma. <laughs> so don't let anyone tell you that they need a diploma unless the program tells you that. Okay. So, um, Martin says, hello, everyone. I'm completely new to all this. Son turned five this summer, made the decision to homeschool one week ago. Would love to know, preferably step by step, what I need to do. Um, anybody want to just highlight what, what, it's on our website under first steps. So um, I know it's a lot of reading, <laughs> but I think now is the time people board shop. Um, wait, we're in March. Maybe more towards March, April, because the budget just came out last week and the boards are still deciding what they're offering for the fall. But um, yeah, I think it's just um, deciding if you want to go supervised with a homeschooling board and get funding, or do you want to just notify with the government, send that form in, and that's it. That's all you do. And there is no funding with that. Um, and to go with the board, um, so when we refer, when we say board, we mean school board and boards are two, there's two kinds of boards. One is one run by a board of trustees. That's either pa uh, the public school divisions or the Catholic school divisions. Those are run by boards of trustees. Not all boards uh, support homeschooling. That's why we say homeschool boards. And then there's the private boards that, and and that's a, a school, usually an independent school, um, that is run by just a board, a me member, like a member, they have a board that they've uh, appointed. And so those boards decide what they're offering and what they can support. And when we talk about facilitators, those are the people who work for the school. The, they're certified teachers, because uh, that was another question, what's a facilitator? They're certified teachers, but they support home education. And the difference between Alberta and, and provinces like British Columbia 
is that in Alberta, you can homeschool without with very little direction and get funding. Whereas in other provinces, you have to have more direction. You have to send things in every month sometimes or every week to a teacher. That's not how this, that's not how it works in Alberta. If you go funded, you only need to do two visits a year. You usually have to write a program plan, which is, is fairly simple. There's uh, free ones up there. There's ones up on the Alberta Homeschool Association site that you can just um, copy from <laughs> and then add your own stuff. And then you hand hand in your program plan. Some some boards have like a checklist that they ask you to form that you fill out, and that's that's your program plan. So you have to write. So the first step is to choose a board or a facilitator, register in September or August or whenever you choose them. The first is your board shopping, then you're deciding which one you want to go with, and then and then you register. You'll have to fill out a form called the home uh, notification to home educate form. You fill that form out and you submit it to that school. Sometimes they also have a registration form that you have to fill out and that's it. And then you, then all you're dealing with from then on is your facilitator and your facilitator is either assigned to you or you pick them and you, and you register under them. And when you have those two visits a year, they should be support visits. They, you, they should be supportive. The first visit is in the, is in the fall. And that's where the facilitator will ask you what you're doing and you tell them or what you're planning to do and you tell them and then the last visits in the spring and you tell them what you did and that's about it <laughs> that, those are the steps and then all the stuff in between if you have a supportive facilitator and they want to help uh, you can usually contact them throughout the year and they can help you with any questions that you have um, most facilitators are like that the, those supportive ones Mo a, a lot of facilitators don't require a lot of paperwork some do so you might want to ask them what they're going to require from you at the end of the year before you start um and and what they're going to what that board is going to require from you at the beginning some people they just want you to fill out a, some boards want you to fill out a form some want you to fill out like a 10 page thing so it depends on what you're comfortable with and then all the stuff in between is you just you just uh allowing your child to educate themselves or making things available available to them or or choosing what you, which direction you want to go and at any point in time in the year you can you can change so i hope that answers that those four or five questions that <laughs> was up there going i they really just by figuring out where to start <laughs> i think the key is that in alberta you do not have to follow alberta curriculum which is so wonderful because there's no testing the only testing is if kids want diploma um credits in social or english they'd have to write diploma exams but there's no testing there's no provincial achievement tests um they go at their own pace and um the outcomes they follow are 22 very very simple simple outcomes that any child who's breathing is going to make so you don't have to feel like you hand you don't hand in work nobody marks the work <laughs> and um actually a lot of times we get I get questions from people saying hey I want to sign up for your homeschooling program and I have to tell people uh we're, we're we don't sign people up we just support them through the system so um so it's you're kind of on your own but you're not really on your own you you get to do what you want but within a supportive community, there's so many people there willing to help you out and um, offer suggestions. Chris, I'd like to, if I could add something. So when, when we say like supervised, that sounds really scary, like coming in and, and, and it's not. So like Golda said, it's just two visits with your facilitator. Um, most like and you can interview facilitators ahead of time before you select them as 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 your facilitator for the year and and I would encourage you to do that um because then you can find out if if you if they have a personality that will work with your personality and and um you can also interview boards instead of interviewing a facilitator um it's it's not that hard you just you call you send an email you do a little bit of research on the internet and and you can find someone and do it 
if you go unsupported, you're not going to have any support. So like, it's, it's, it's a really good idea, I think, to go supported because you get that, um, so some of the boards offer like field trips and different things and different community groups that you can be part of. And having a community as a homeschooler is so important. Like I can't even tell you how, how important that is. It just, it, it really helps. Um, and the other thing, thing is like if if you have a facilitator you can ask them questions through the year it's it's really good and it's not it shouldn't be it shouldn't be hard to go support it it's not so I just want to make sure people understand that who are new if that makes sense That's... excellent okay um that's good Cynthia do you want to add anything or we could go on to the next Okay, so Megan says, how do you incorporate reading and writing? So um, for those of you new to home education or in Alberta, we're, tonight's topic is, is we're talking about one method of home education. There's, if you want to direct teach and, you know, you can't wait to get that whiteboard in your kitchen and, and teach lessons. That's great. That's wonderful. If that's going to work for your kids and you, you know, you get to do whatever you want. Um, tonight, we're talking about a method of home education where um, children find their interests just by living life and you just kind of run with it. You um, facilitate their interests, you get them what they want so they can explore their interests more and they learn pretty well all the outcomes of the Alberta curriculum through play and their interests. So when Megan says, how do you incorporate reading and writing, or is that literally hands off too? Um, how would you guys respond to that? Uh, go to Cynthia or Krista, what would you say? Well, my son wasn't interested at all in spelling or being around the table or doing anything written he he just would ignore he would be upset he would scream and fight <laughs> just be just not enjoy it at all and so we actually for him what worked is we would sit and read uh words out of books or dictionaries things that he was interested in and he would spell them verbally so we did it we did it completely verbal instead of instead of doing um you know, directly with a, with a hand and a pen and, and all of that. Um, he doesn't enjoy cursive, but he can write. Um, and yeah, so it's for us, that was, it was, it was much more on the verbal side of things and, and reading came fairly easy for both of my boys. Uh, so, but for some, it doesn't, maybe I should pass that over to Krista. She does a lot of her, <laughs> Her passion is literacy. So <laughs> I'll give her the floor for a sec. Okay. Um, well, like, so for me, I guess I can go to the question about like, how do you incorporate reading and writing? So my kids, I've been unschooling them for a while now. My kids, I take them to the library and they find books that they're interested in and they just, they want to read them. So I, I'm I'm pretty lucky that way. They They love to read, but from the beginning, I, I was always reading to them. I'd find books that I thought would interest them. I'd let them pick books out and then I would read them to them. Or like if they were into Lego, we'd get books about Lego things or origami and we'd try and make them the origami items. It, we, we did a lot of stuff like that. We listened to a lot of audio books. So um, it, when we're in the car, when we go out for a walk, that can actually motivate my kids to listen to an audiobook while we're walking because otherwise walking is quite boring. Um, <laughs> uh, even sometimes eating breakfast will listen to an audiobook. So th that helps. Um, I get them to incorporate writing through a lot of daily life stuff. So it's like, oh, we need to go to the grocery store and, and we're running out of like milk. Can you just write down milk on the grocery list? And so they'll do that and things like that, that we have to remember or um, adding things to the calendar. I get them to do that with like, and, and so that's, that's how I kind of started out incorporating 
reading and writing, if that makes sense. And it, it, they wanted to do it. They wanted to help out and they wanted to be part of, part of it. So. And my son wasn't interested in writing at all and still isn't really. Although he decided from some kind of social media meme that cursive writing was like a, because he can read now and it took him a long time to learn to read, but he decided that cursive writing was actually a secret code for adults. And now he's motivated to learn how to do it. <laughs> so he decided that <laughs> and he, uh, he decided that he was going to learn cursive all on his own. I didn't even need to, I did. So there was another question up there about um, like, is there anything that you should encourage them to do? And I think that life will encourage them, like when they realize that other people do it, and it's not just a thing that grownups make kids do, they get interested in it. So it's like the reading thing for him, he felt forced and he doesn't like to be forced to do anything. So in grade three, when I took him out of school, he still couldn't read, even at a grade one level. And at, at some point he saw a book in a bookstore that he wanted to read and he was suddenly motivated to learn. He's like, so that's what books are for. They're for learning things. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can learn that from a book in a bookstore, he says. And I said, yes, you can learn anything from books. And he goes, well, that's it. I need to learn how to read. And six months later, he could read. And I, and I think so being self-motivated is what this is all about. And it's. It, when when they're self motivated, they learn fast because we all do. If we learn, if we're if we're motivated from somewhere inside of us, we want to, and so we put all of our energy and ability into something. And the hardest part about unschooling, I think, is learning to trust that they will. Is 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 the is that fear of what if they don't? And but I I haven't seen too many that that do not yeah there I actually none I haven't seen any kid that doesn't learn how to read as long as they're given when they're interested given the tools that they need including kids with uh with difficulties so my my five kids um all their first English class was grade 11 and um up until then we just did what the rest of you did you know we had library night and we uh read out loud until they were in the teens. And um, they learned a lot of reading and writing through video games. Um, I think one day I just said, I'm not writing in your cheat codes anymore. You're gonna have to do it. And they're pecking the keyboard, putting in their cheat codes so that you know they can bypass a certain level. And, and that's how they were motivated. They wanted to read those video game books, you know, the books you buy that walks you through different um, things like that. So. They, they wanted to read those things. So um, writing, of course, having four boys, they hated to write. <laughs> and um, I, you know, they didn't have to write really until about grade 11, grade 12, where they had to write two essays for social and two essays for um, English to get the credit in those levels. But hey, that was four essays I had to write plus diploma exams. Um, but where they really, really learned to write was first year university. Um, they all took a course on how to write academically. And they were a little, uh, one thing is that they went from one course at a time in grade 12 to five courses, five full course loads. And they, um, but they did it. They learned how to write academically, how to do APA citations or MLA citations and they were motivated that was their goal that's what they wanted to do so they took the time to learn it off the internet so yes we were hands off we I find if I push something the kids smell it and go hmm too academic no and they run away so it has to be enjoyable for them so anything that's enjoyable they would love to do anything that they feel pushed to do they won't love to do it and they'll resist and they could have a um what do you call that a a hang up about things if you push it too much you know then they they see themselves as a very poor learner and you don't want that you want to encourage the love of learning the love of learning to write beautifully and that comes it absolutely comes Okay, 
I think we finished that question. Um, Linnell, Linnell says, how do we know and follow child's lead? Is it more through exposure? Say read alouds, baking, nature walking, then see if they're interested and just go with it. I'm doing inspired Waldorf curriculum and often we just do what interests him. He's kindergarten. So how much do you expose them to other things? Do you guys strew? Do you want to talk about what strewing is? <laughs> how much do you push what you want them to get interested in? Anybody want to start? Yeah, I, I, I personally tried that, but uh, he, he resists my <laughs> attempts. Some kids do, um, but yeah, strewing is just like having stuff around the house, just there. Hopefully they get interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially for kindergarten, I think though, Judy, because that's the, the, there was a podcast that you did and that was part of it, wasn't it? The strewing, just leaving boxes. You, I think you said you brought out different boxes every week so that they would get yeah. interested in certain things. I do. I have a whole set of blue Rubbermaid bins and I have um, the post office bin, you know, where <laughs> we, set, we set up these little cardboard post office boxes outside everyone's room and then we write messages and, and um, when I need to get some work done, I'll get them started on something like that, but it, they may not want to do it and they may do it for 20 minutes and drop it and that's okay, right? So if you have a bin on different themes, it's kind of fun too. Yeah. Cynthia? I would get, I used to get like all different books from the library and I, I still do. Like if there's something that I think my kid might be interested in, I just get books from the library and sometimes they'll pick them up and other times they don't. Um, and that's okay. I just, you know, it, 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 I think it's important to, offer them different things like like you know like would you like to go try laser tag would you like to go to the zoo would you like to because sometimes if you don't offer it to them or or talk to them about it or if they don't learn about it or see it in, in a book then they're not even going to know to ask so um, I think that's kind of an important thing to to do when we're unschooling so and of course, they aren't always going to take you up on it, <laughs> but sometimes they do. Yeah, um, sometimes they totally do. And sometimes a friend comes over and something that they wouldn't have even normally thought of is to go dig through the recycle bin and make something. And, you know, my son wouldn't necessarily do that on his own. But, you know, another friend who, you know, he keenly enjoys his interests also. It's like, ooh, what are we doing? This is really cool. <laughs> He, he never did ever go to that bin again, except with his friend. And they would come up with all sorts of wild and wild and crazy things. And, and, um, and funny of all things, you know, my kids have pretty much cooked and baked alongside me and, you know, they wouldn't necessarily, you know, jump into it if not invited. So sometimes like these gals have all said inviting, just inviting and saying, Hey, do you want to cook supper with me tonight? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. Or no, not really. Or my sister dropped off a box of HelloFresh meals that she couldn't use. And we don't order that. We usually cook everything from scratch. But um, it works for her. And she was leaving. And she's like, I can't use these meals. Well, my boys were in there like, what? There's cards? We can just follow this. Like, this is so awesome. So I'm like, okay, which one? You pick this one. You do this night. And so we had two meals that week that I didn't have to cook because they it was something different something completely different and then we went away for a night which is fairly rare but my husband and I got away to see some friends while we're gone my son is like where's the cocoa do we do we have any fresh lemons and he made these like donut things with the chocolate and lemony glaze sauce I would never pick that out of a recipe for me to make I'm pretty pretty simple but he wanted to go ahead and do that on his own it's amazing what they just jump into when invited Excellent. Yeah. Um, I Carly, I'm just gonna most of the things my son sorry, most of the things my son got into or interested in was something he saw on YouTube. I'm just saying that's a good <laughs> a good way. Okay, sorry, Judy. I think 
that is a good concern because a lot of parents just watch their kids on YouTube and um and worry and worry because they're not doing anything that looks anything like conventional learning and um kids may do that I mean there's a lot of good stuff on YouTube <laughs> I mean I doom scroll when I'm avoiding doing laundry or or dishes or something but um but there is many many ways to learn and lots of resources to learn for sure um Carly, I'm just going to address that, um, yes, you can sure facilitate your son's interests, um, even though he's in high school. Absolutely. And I just want to stress that nobody has to finish high school at 18. Um, and it's not like when they're 28 and decide, hey, you know, I want to be a plumber. They're not going to be forced to go back to high school and <laughs> pick up the courses they need. That's There's adult upgrading courses there's ways they could do it online if they're motivated there's ways they could pick up um, high school courses at universities now they're paying university prices but you know they're they're getting into the groove so um, education does not they don't need to have it all figured out by age 18 or 19 or 25 or 40 or even 60 you know they it's it's a journey it's not a race so I wouldn't worry at all. Well, that's my spiel. And apparently Alberta is coming up with their own GED for those people who need that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Because the GED is ending in May. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I didn't start university till age 27. I was a waitress first. Waitress and I worked in retail and decided at 27. And it went, and, and actually I found out through that that you don't need a high school diploma in order to go to university. Surprise. <laughs> Especially if you're 27 when you start. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you don't. Um yeah, interesting. Um do you think we answered everybody's questions? Do you have more questions? I think there's Carly. Carly has a, a question here. She says, sorry to go back to high school. Uh, my son is going into grade 10 next year and has autism. He probably will not get his diploma at this point. Can we facilitate his interests even though he is in high school? Yes. Yes, you can. Yeah, in fact, it's even more freeing if they don't want to get it, if they are not going to get a diploma and that's not a possibility or a probability. I mean, he can always go back later and challenge diploma exams if he decides to. But what, if you really, if high school doesn't mean you need to have credits or need to be working at, on credits, it just is an option. And so if they're in high school and they decide they don't want credits and don't want a diploma, there's other ways to get what they want. And so if you, you can let the that go, you can let go of the expectations that he will get if you're going to let go of the expectation that he gets a diploma you can do anything i mean there's massive open online courses in almost any subject that a kid might want through universities for free out, out there there's uh there's if if he wants to do coursework instead he could be learning how to fix cars or yeah. learn how to be an amazing baker or whatever whatever path he wants to take and it doesn't have to be for a future job either it can just be so that he uh, you know, is is learning something that he's interested in, which people do anyway. We all do that. We all get interested in certain things and then take off with it and dive headfirst and and learn everything that we can about it or everything that we're interested in about it. And then we stop and we go to something else. I think all almost all humans do that if we allow ourselves to. And Carly, my son has an autism diagnosis also. And we are still not sure exactly what a diploma would even look like for him. We, I go back and forth with that all the time. I literally slide on the scale and we will have a new facilitator this year. And I have to talk to her about that because I, I still haven't, I'm not, I, I don't know when he doesn't know. And so we sort of feel like we're at a bit of a standstill with that. But one of the things like we're going back to program plans and we have done this even in like grade eight, grade nine and last year, grade 10. 
um, we put on his program plan, personal hygiene, because that was a very difficult thing for him for a long time for him to learn how to do a shower. Not that I had to be in there. He didn't want me in there, but even for him to get in there on his own, it was a very difficult thing. And so that's one of the reasons why I absolutely loved homeschooling is because our unschooling specifically is I can write that on the program plan and we can go back and go, oh my goodness, my husband and I still stand in the hallway with literally air fist pumps and we're like, he is in the shower. <laughs> like we are so excited. And that's progress for us. Somebody else, that might have been something they did at five years old. My son didn't do that until he was like 15. So these are these are the most amazing things that you get to walk your kids through or they walk through also it's I mean it's for us to celebrate too but you know they're celebrating like I did it now I can do something and it can be as simple and as important as being able to get in the shower putting deodorant on making sure you have clean clothes and and realizing that you know physical care of themselves is also a great learning curve for some Cynthia, I love that. I, I, when my boys were around 13 too, we definitely put that on our program plan. Like, you know, <laughs> it's a must. <laughs> I wrote down that you probably get your soap reimbursed. <laughs> Do you? I, I hadn't thought of that. I should have put that in. <laughs> put, put my receipt in for deodorant, soap, shower gel, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> my water bell maybe <laughs> Why not? put it on there <laughs> yeah that's right well, well I can get internet covered and then we and that's for like most everything else if we're doing personal hygiene maybe it's a percentage of that water bill that I could get reimbursed I think you could you could argue for that and <laughs> I just want to tell everybody, um, your kids are funded until age 20 so yes. if you're an unschooler, you're, you're covered. You can keep claiming, you know, your soap or your hot water or your internet for. <laughs> just though, just a point that most boards can't cover those things. I'm just saying <laughs> that <laughs> the government says that if the government guidelines say that if it's uh, something other parents that are in public school have to pay for that, you, you can't get reimbursed for it. I just might. <laughs> Put that in there. I know you guys are joking. But <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. Don't mislead these things. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I pushed the envelope. Yeah, that's, yeah, that would get clawed back by Alberta Education for sure. <laughs> oh, gets covered because We're, that was science, and we made we made homemade wine, and yeah, I. Yep, I, I claimed a lot of things. And that was after the regulations came out. So if it's in your program plan um, and you can really justify um, the educational value of it, then hopefully your board will go to bat for you against Alberta Education. Yeah, they do. they can sometimes argue effectively. But the boards do have like they do have limitations on what they can do. And once a board gets money clawed back from Alberta education and they've paid it out, they're a bit more gun shy when it comes to um, reimbursing things that might be iffy. I know I've seen that through the last few years. <laughs> they, they I wonder get... if you added soap making to your, your science Ooh, project, yes, you could making... probably get the ingredients that, that to make the soap. So... <laughs> Yes, you could. You could get that reimbursed. There, see, so <laughs> so we're going to get it funded somehow for you, yes. your families. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so making would be covered. <laughs> there was another question. I know I answered it in the chat, but it was about secular or non-religious facilitators. Uh, there are there are lots of non-religious facilitators out there. I just wanted to put because that was one of the question. I know that and, it's thought of as like that homeschooling is all religious and there is an awful lot of religious boards out there, mostly Christian, but there's a lot of facilitators and boards, mm -hmm. not a lot, but uh, quite a few that are not religious. 
But even if they were Golda, can you still, like, if you say we're, you know, strapped for a spot, you know, when you, if you're getting close to the end and there's a lot of spots that aren't taken, they would still have to honor where you're at, right? Yeah, most of them would. Yeah. Okay. Okay. On our list, we, um, we ask them, that is a question, if they require a face statement. Yeah. If they do. Oh, I see. That means they're okay if you do not uh, follow that same faith. But if they do require a faith statement, it's kind of, um, yeah, you do have to follow their faith. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that, Judy, because I didn't know the answer to that. Okay. And yeah. if you can't find a, a facilitator that's in your community, you can find a facilitator in another community. They can be on the other end of the province, and that is totally okay. Yeah. So. Just like you're not Very limited to your small area where, where you live. So, yeah. yeah, that's a good point, actually, for newcomers to home education is that most facilitators are now offering their visits on Zoom instead of having you in their home. Yes. And yeah. it's faster <laughs> and easier. Yes. Now, this, I'm going to bring it back to unschooling a bit. Um, what happens um, if you sign up with a board and you get a facilitator and by November they're coming out to your home and saying, okay, where are the worksheets that have been done? What, and you unschool, which means that you may have a child that doesn't want to do worksheets. How would you approach handling that? Or um, is it your right to home unschool? Can you, um, do you have to feel like you have to do the worksheets yourself to produce some work? What do you guys suggest about handling that? That has that has happened to other parents. We we get calls about that sometimes, right? So that does happen. That's why it's so important to do research and talk to the facilitator you might have ahead of time because you don't want that. That's very stressful. Mm -hmm. And uh and and I know some facilitators have required quite long reports at the end of the year with evidence and 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 I mean like re really long reports with a lot of evidence and I think that's not required by the government so that's a decision by a school board or by a facilitator because they have a mindset that they don't trust parents so find a facilitator that does but if you're in the middle of the year and a facilitator comes you have a few options you can complain to the school board itself that would be the principal usually, or the director of, of the program, um, and ask for a different one, ask for a facilitator. You could talk to the facilitator and tell her, tell her or him, no, I'm not doing that. Or you can change boards after you get your funding um, because some, some do take people mid-year and they do it for that reason because that has happened quite mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> or you could just notify with the government and say, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, changed my mind. Not thanks for the funny guy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's totally legal. Um, we often get asked that question. It's totally legal because it's just a method of um teaching and learning. Um, self-directed education is very valid. A lot of schools do it, but because they get funding, lots of funding from the government, um, they do have to teach the outcomes of the Alberta programs of study but you do not have to on home education. You can hmm. you can teach whatever you want using, you know, the curriculum of Nintendo if you want, <laughs> like we did. Um, it's all, you're in the driver's seat and um, you have the right to have a facilitator that supports you in your, your vision, your goal, um, and what you want for your child. So um, if it's not a good fit, yeah, I would I would do as Golda suggests, and and it it kind of helps too in the first visit or when they assign you a facilitator. If you have a meet and greet and say, "Hey, I'm unschooling," do you you know just to let them know that if they can't support you with that, maybe they should pass you on to a different facilitator that will. Mm -hmm. I know facilitators that take Instagram accounts as like, so a parent will set up an Instagram account just for homeschooling and just have their family and their facilitator as 
followers and, and just post their pictures throughout the year of what their kids are doing. And that's it. That's the evidence. <laughs> there you go. Done. Perfect. So un unschooling is funded. That somebody just asked that. Unschooling is funded. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Um, you and just kindergarten have to is kindergarten oh, yeah. is now funded, right? Across yeah. the board, all boards do it. Okay. And then you, that's half of what you typically get. So um, students grade one through age 20 can receive $901 per year. Uh, you submit your receipts to your uh, home ed board that you've signed up with, and then they reimburse you from there. Um, and their reimbursement structure is unique to them. So just speak with them as to whether you can get it all back in the fall if you submit $901 at that time or if they do it split up throughout the year. It's yeah, everybody everybody kind of has a different a different protocol for that. Um and kindergarten is half of that. So what is that? $450.50 or something like that. That's great. <laughs> so that's great for kindergarten. Oh my gosh, you can do a ton of stuff with $450 for a kindergarten student. That's so fun. So, And it should be going up this year. So I'm, we're just waiting for the government to see what uh, the fa funding manual comes out and gives those amounts. So, And yes, Michelle, you will only get funded if you have receipts. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you can buy things at garage sales or off Facebook Marketplace, but just make sure you get a um, write down the name and address and amount and date of what you purchased. And that should be okay, but check with your board. Yeah, most boards allow you to do that. I think most boards want you to get your funding. They want you, they want you to have it. They don't want to hold on to it because actually, unless you sign a form signing it over to them, if you don't use it, they have to send it back to Alberta Education. And I'm sure every board goes oh <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> do they claw it back yeah and I think, what is it you need only two-thirds of your funding receipts and then they give you the rest of it is it two-thirds 75 percent 75 percent okay thank you I wasn't sure <laughs> yeah so if you get 75 percent in receipts they can release the whole nine hundred and one dollars or four fifty and fifty cents so as long as you get up to 75 percent you get all of it yeah. I just throw everything in a box for the year, like anything that remotely looks like I could claim it, like, um, you know, grocery bills, <laughs> um, books, anything, games, things like that. Like a lot of things you buy for holidays or birthdays, you could probably claim if they're, in, you know, on your, and then I, tend to add them to my program plan after I bought them and go, oh yeah, I want this covered. So, and I always have way more receipts than I have money, but yeah, that's the nature. So. I think on the Alberta homeschooling website, there's also like a list of different questions you can ask when you're interviewing a homeschool facilitator. Maybe I should look that and and add it to the chat in case anybody's interested. Um, so one of the questions was, uh, if what location? So again, you can choose any board in the province that supports homeschooling. Any one of those schools, um, well, not any one of them. Some of them are location dependent, but most of the homeschool boards in Alberta will take anybody from Alberta and they're allowed to do that. So you don't have to find anybody in your location if, if you don't want to, if none aligns with your vision. Yeah. So somebody in um, Peace River can sign up with a board in Lethbridge, really. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. And um, the facilitators either travel out to visit them once a year and a visit is only like an hour. They They meet all the kids within that. Or a lot, I think, still do Zoom. If if yeah. almost, I don't know of any board that's not doing Zoom, aside from the ones that are location specific, mm. because um, traveling is expensive, it's time consuming, and it's easier to serve more people if you don't travel. So I think there's lots that 
most of them don't anymore unless you want them to. And if you have a child like mine who doesn't want to meet anybody, yeah, he didn't want to talk to anybody. I mean, he was the kid that didn't get a haircut. I had to learn how to cut his hair. Um, you know, doctor's appointments, chiropractor, all of that is very, very, very stressful for him. Just has been starting to go to the dentist now at 15, 16 years old. Um, so if you have that problem, meeting your facilitator might be very, very difficult <laughs> for your whole entire family. And so Zoom was amazing. And how that's going to work for you and your family is, is going to be unique to you. Um, but that is where you really want to hone in. Um, I did not have a clue when I first started. I did not interview anybody. I, I didn't know anything, but we landed with a an amazing facilitator who really uh, was, she was so patient with us. And she has gone from having my son walk by just behind me to see that he actually did exist uh, to where he sits face to face with her. And now she's retired. <laughs> Thank goodness. I know people now in this, in this field, because I can, I can find somebody who knows us well again, but up until that point, it, yeah, it was touch and go every year. Sometimes it was like, okay, let's do a $25 steam gift card. <laughs> I'm going to bribe you just to sit with her. And, you know, is that the right thing to do? I don't know. But we, it was just our way. We worked through it. And to go from not being able to talk to her at all or look at her, um, he is now being able to go across the, across the screen and visit with her. So every family has their challenges. Every family has successes. And so, yeah, you'll, you've heard so many of each of ours tonight. So that's good. Excellent. Thanks. Um, Kyla says, okay, we can sign up with a board and facilitator and just tell them our plan of unschooling. And well, um, and you don't have to follow curriculum or government guidelines. Yeah. Um, yeah. sort of, yes, absolutely. But um, you do have to write out a program plan of what you're going to do that year now or what you expect you're gonna do that's problematic for unschoolers who don't plan <laughs> so what um so you can keep it as vague as possible like you can write down under activities that you're gonna go to the library once a week and you know come in the spring maybe you didn't go to the library once a week that's okay you can put that down it's it's a work in progress Nobody holds you to what you write in there. Um, one year I, you know, we all start the year with all these plans and goals. And then we, we feel shorted at the, at our spring facilitator visit and go, oh gosh, I have nothing to show her. I, you know, we didn't seem to do anything at all. And we worry, and that's not true. You know, you, um, kids breathe they're going to be doing something so you can change that at any time don't let it don't let it seem so intimidating so yeah anybody else want to add to that one there there is actually a home education regulation where there's requirements for home education there's a list of 22 things i think i did just post it and you'll see it's quite vague and it's over 20, uh, like over the 12 years of education that you have to teach that. But it's 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 vague, like learn to read from enjoy for enjoyment and information is, I think, the first one. It's it's very it's quite vague. And so um, it there there is really uh, like there is a list out there. That is what they tie the funding to is is that people are meeting those requirements. But I let you read it and see how. Most of them are soft skills, like learn to work as a team. They don't have to do that in kindergarten. They can do that later. So it, it's just, just so just so you know, there is a list of requirements that is not government curriculum, but it is there is a regulation. <laughs> yes. Excellent. But it's easy to meet. Like you don't have to follow the Alberta program of studies or outcomes or curriculum a lot of people get stuck thinking that they have to do that it's um 
Golda, you've talked about this before, how a lot of the Alberta programs of study outcomes are so in-depth and complicated and designed to intimidate even teachers, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. where um, they have to meet a lot of outcomes and then they have to provide assessments to see if they've met those outcomes. We do not have to do any of that in home education or unschooling. Um, I think the difference is in, in school, teachers look at the outcomes, they plan a lesson, they teach it, and then they assess the kids to see if they learned anything. And yet in unschooling, what we do is watch the kids play, think, oh, they've met this and this outcomes in the home ed plan and write it down and maybe take mm -hmm. a picture. And that's all we do. And mm -hmm. we don't need to pre-plan anything. And I know that goes totally against what um, teachers do, right? They are, they are ingrained there. It's hammered into them that you got to plan lessons. Um, in unschooling, you don't. You don't have to use any package curriculum. You can fine tune and personalize it to each child um, where their interests are. And it's so motivating to watch you know, how everything you in your house is um, can be used to teach something or for them to learn something. I know. Anyone want to add to that? Um, there, I, like my my son, I, I worried because he couldn't read when he first came out of school. I, I was worried. I was worried that he wouldn't learn math. But then when he, I think... He got, I, I just want to outline how kids get interested in things and why they end up meeting the, the pro, you know, they end up meeting the requirements anyway, just on their own without any prompting. Like my son went to play with a bunch of neighborhood kids. I live in a really small town of 200 people. He went to play with some neighbor kids outside just last year. And for some reason, they started talking about math and he realized that he didn't know what they knew. And so he came home. He's like, I need to learn that because I felt stupid. And so he went on Khan Academy and taught himself how to do that kind of math. And then he was satisfied that he knew it. And so you never know how they're or we were, went to an indigenous um, uh, education thing where they were digging up rat root and the the elders were talking about how that was medicine and he's like that's medicine like what the doctor gives you I said yeah it's just a different kind and so he got interested in herbal medicine and I'd uh you know I'd come into the kitchen and he'd be boiling dandelion roots or whatever he was doing I wasn't allowed to touch it because I might wreck it with my energy he said so he was boiling pots of things and there was dirt all over the counter and he was <laughs> making potions and uh, herbal remedies that he had read about in a book or saw on a YouTube channel. So you never know what they're going to get interested in. And and they do. It doesn't matter how uninterested they you think they are. They'll get interested in something because that's being human. We get interested in things. We just walk through life and we something catches our eye and then we and he gets hyper focused on things that he's interested in. So that's helpful. <laughs> but yeah. That's so true. I, I got to tell you, my son at 13, he and his homeschool buddies were doing a little class at the CBE school up in Wildwood. And uh, I, I didn't even know he could do this or he was interested in it or how he self-studied it, but they hacked into their internet system for the school. And it was the only time I actually had a principal call me and say, um, um, uh, <laughs> they can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you need to fix your uh, security systems a bit better, right? And I was exactly. totally surprised that these kids could do this. But yeah, they're, you know, you're going to be blown away by what your kids know. Um, like, yeah, my kids face that too, Golda, where, you know, they didn't know how to sing the anthem at Brownies. So they came home and said, I felt stupid. I would need to know the anthem. And yet they were way ahead in other areas that... Mm -hmm kids in school weren't into or didn't know about either right so I think it's important to protect their self-esteem and and their confidence and say well 
Yeah, but look how far you can go in this. A lot of kids in your grade wouldn't know about this, but you do, right? Well, I think I think the the thing I thought was interesting about him coming home, even though he felt stupid, and we all do sometimes, no matter if we're adults or kids, we run into something we think we should have known and we didn't know. Um, but I think the important thing is that his first response was not to feel helpless and look to an outside source, like to blame or to to feel like he went, I'm going to learn this. I'm going to seek out that information. How do I do it? And then I went, oh, here's the tools that are available so that you can learn that if you want. So my job was just coming up with the resources. His, his job was to figure out what he wanted to learn and then to actually learn it when it, mm -hmm. when I found what he needed. Yeah. So it, it just changes the, the whole dynamic is, is he didn't feel helpless. He felt stupid for a minute and that's normal. We all do have that sometimes where we wish we knew something or we, we feel like we didn't know what we were supposed to know. And then we, we come back and go, okay, what do, what do we do? So that's maybe more like adult thinking in the world of schooling, isn't it? Is that they, yeah. they're in, in school, they sit there and they're just recipients. Mm -hmm. They're just consumers. And instead of that, he took it into his own hands to figure out how to do something he thought that he wanted to learn how to do, regardless of the reason. <laughs> so good. That's great. Okay. We we are almost out of time, aren't we? But we do have one. I think more there's question one that... question that we've missed, and I think it's a pretty quick one to answer. It's from Carlene. She says, "If I want to world school, are there specific boards for doing that?" And she says, "My home base would still be in Alberta. Also, would there still be government funding available for this?" I believe she can go with any board, and as long as she's a resident of Alberta on is it September 29th or 30th? September 29th. Yeah. Yeah. They're supposed to technically be in the province September 29th, but I don't know who checks that. I just legally, they're supposed to be in the province on September 29th. Yeah. And um, government, the funding, the home education funding um, will cover things like the child's museum tickets. So um, we, we took our kids traveling all over and um, museums, science centers, zoos, anything that's that education, um, you would have to um, write on the receipt, um, the, the, what do you call it, the foreign exchange rate, and then um, just claim the child's part. The regulations are they don't pay for parents. So that's probably the only thing in world schooling you could claim other than supplies you buy on the road. Yeah, um, you can programs on the computer. Actually, you can claim that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The usual technology things, but you can't claim the gas or the Airbnb or the <laughs> the flight. Darn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Is so. I think we kind of. Oh, wait a sec. Um, Kyla says, "Would I be able to join a board after spring break?" It's a little hard for boards to to accept rescues now because we're almost through the end of the year. Um, you wouldn't get funding. It would cost them a facilitator visit. So it might be just better to notify with the government for the rest of the year. That's what I tell everyone. It's just the easiest. And then go board shopping this spring and set things in place for fall. Yeah. Oh, Krista, you did that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So anything else? I think we got through all the questions and maybe we'll just go around to our panel and is there anything you missed out? Any last words you want to leave with people? I would say that unschooling is great. It's It's been like the best thing. Like I tried different things with my kid, like I said at the beginning, and it just wasn't working. But unschooling, she's engaged. She's learning a lot. And I'm learning from her. And I'm learning as we go too. It's 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 really fun. And it's it's it takes a lot of time as a parent. It's not like hands off, you'd go do your own thing. Like it is to some extent, but to another extent, you you need to help them to 
find out what they want to learn and and you you're actually a facilitator doing it and um i think it's it's definitely worth exploring it's 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 the best way of learning that we've found in our house yeah and push past your fear of all the things that you think might go wrong or could go wrong or all of that just push past all of that because your kids will they will wow you <laughs> And you will be like, oh my goodness, I did something I didn't even think I could do. Um, because the fear, you know, the guilt, the, all those things, it's, it, it, it doesn't really ever go away. You just have to tell it to shush and, and say, not today. We are going to do this. This is what we've decided. Make the decision and then just take the steps forward. And then it all just kind of like tick, 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 tick. And time just goes by. And I love having them home. I love it. I've gotten all this time with them that I would have never have had otherwise. I mean, they're not teens that just disappear and just go all over the place. They they actually stay at home on weekends. It's they're fun. They're fun, fun, fun people. I I think oh, sorry. Go ahead, Judy. I would have to say, um, yeah, my kids are my best friends. We now that they're in their twenties and early 30s we world school together and um all five got accepted to university so our university acceptance rate is a hundred percent right um and i think they really enjoyed the the free time the free time mm -hmm. they had to explore things really deeply or not at all or to really grow their passions and i think um um a few aren't too sure of where their direction is going to be, but three of them are definitely in the direction they really, really wanted to be. And it's because of all the free time they had to to do what they wanted to do. So I we they don't even regret unschooling. Um, I never told my husband what we were doing until they all got accepted to university. So <laughs> and now he's the biggest rah rah. <laughs> oh. No, you were writing a book. <laughs> uh, I think it was a, a big leap for me because I came from the world of education. I'd been a teacher for 16 years in the classroom and a school principal. And so I think I I I, I understand fear very well. When I first when I first started, I really had to work at not thinking in that schooly way. But I, I do agree and I've seen a lot of people change their relationship with their children and and their children uh, changing their relationship with their siblings that's what one of the best things about that is that they, it's it just changes because they don't have that stress of the school system and the competitive nature of like a negative competitive nature in the school system and when I was a teacher I noticed that kids that were homeschooled or unschooled would come into the classroom say in grade 10 or 12 because they wanted something they wanted a credit or whatever and they'd take my class they were with one sitting at the front of the class like avidly interested in what I was saying it's almost like the twilight zone because here you have a class and you're used to having a class full of kids that are not engaged in their learning that don't want to be there that are like on their phones or doing whatever, trying to distract themselves from the pain of sitting in a classroom. And then this one kid watching you <laughs> everything, hanging on every word that you say. And it's like, what is going on with that child? <laughs> and I'd ask them and they'd tell me that they'd been homeschooled. And I'm like, oh, so they get engaged in their own learning. They get really interested in learning. And as a, because it's a process of, of something that they think is fun. They don't have that idea. And the, and this and colleges and universities are reporting the same phenomena when they have a kid that's coming out of uh, home education programs. They are more, more interested, they get higher grades, they're they're more engaged in their learning. And and kids that have been unschooled are when they first go into the post-secondary world, they're genuinely puzzled why people People are happy that a class is canceled. They wanted to go to class. They're interested in, in learning. So we we develop lifelong learners when we do, when we unschool, I, in my opinion, based on what I've seen. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. And um, thank you for sharing this evening with us. Thank you, Golda and Cynthia and Krista and for um, sharing your knowledge and experience. I think I think that was helpful.
And uh, thank you, you, Judy. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Judy. Well, this thank is you. this is great. So yeah, stay tuned. Um, I know we have gotten quite a lot of requests for uh, homeschooling 101. So we're gonna have to talk about putting one of those on before school's out. And because um, we'll get other people after spring break wanting to pull their kids out. So stay tuned. Yep. Well, stay tuned also for the high school one. And uh, we'll put it on the front page of Alberta homeschooling. So thank you all. And we will close off. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>